for the association for international affairs. Uh, this panel um, well, is supposed to be oriented on the topic of uh, what's a part of the digital, of the transatlantic market, which is a digital transatlantic market, and all services related uh, to, to this very concrete uh, part of both European and uh, US uh, economies. Um, we, uh, the, 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 this, let's say, uh, specific topic is quite uh, recently being discussed by, uh, by many economists all around the world. Uh, we had uh, some studies uh, from, from, from ECG, uh, whose uh, representative is sitting on the panel with us, that um, the, the study was published uh, quite recently uh, on G, uh, G8 summit in, in Paris, G20 summit in Paris. That uh, the internet has, has contributed to the, to the world economic growth in, uh, in in Western Europe and in the United States by 20, uh, 20, 21 percent in in, in uh, recent years. So this is a very important part of the economy, and uh, we have uh, business representatives in in this panel who would, uh, who, uh, would say would speak of concrete uh, consequences on of of transatlantic uh, trade and investment partnership on, on businesses because we in, in, in previous panels we, we heard lots of, lots of words about how the, the, the partnership will uh, contribute to, uh, to, to the economic growth but the economic growth is generated by the companies uh, not by, uh, by state them, states themselves. So uh, let me introduce um, panelists of, of, of this panel. Uh, I was struck on my, my, my left, Simon Hampton, uh, the Director of, of uh, Government Affairs of Google for EU countries. Uh, Nico Lewis, Vice President of, uh, of UBS, uh, responsible for, for, for Government Relations and Corporate Affairs. Uh, uh, Mr. Kowal, uh, from Austin Consulting Group, and uh, right, uh, who is joining us, uh, Professor Maestri, um, uh, from, from Charles University, and at the same time, he is a member, he has been a member of uh, many advisory bodies of the government, whatever name they had recently, it's uh, called NERF, National Economic Council of the Government. So I will start with, with Mr. Hampton, floor is yours, and we'll just stay on your seat or go to the table. Thank you so much. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm going to stand up so that I give an exercise while I'm talking. So, why is Google taking an interest um, in an event like this? Let me first of all give you an idea of what Google does, because I think sometimes we will take uh, we take Google for granted somewhat. Um, we're a company with 40 offices uh, uh, around the world. In Prague, we've got about 30 people. And obviously what we provide is a search engine, and we do that in 100 languages. But we make money um, by providing advertising opportunities. So when you are searching for a particular term, whatever it might be, car insurance, let's say, a number of advertisers have also logged into the Google system, a different part of the one that you see when you're searching, but they've logged in and say, if somebody is searching for, let's say, car insurance, then I would like my advertisement to show. And some people say, I want my advertisement to show when people are searching for flowers. And some people say, when people are searching for a uh, digital camera, for example. And so we match people looking for something to people trying to sell something. Um, and the advertisements that you need to work on Google Search, they're very small. They work with just, you know, just a few words. Um, and those words can obviously be quite easily translated into other languages. And so you can say to Google, I would like, when somebody is searching for uh, car insurance in Czech, then I would like this advertisement to show, written in the Czech language, um, on google.cz. But if they're coming from Poland and they're searching on google.pl, well then I would like this advertisement to show that's in Polish um, when people are searching on google.pl. And so it is a absolute, it's a very simple and very easy method to be able to run an advertising campaign over any number of countries, certainly within the European Union, um, but obviously within the context of this debate, 
between the EU and the US. So if it's easy to go out and find customers, and I think uh, Nick will tell us in a minute, it's easy to fulfill orders to other customers because there's a logistics uh, system that will uh, enable you to get your goods to somebody. Then the question is, is why don't we make that opportunity really come to pass um, and get the growth that could come from uh, get the growth that could come from uh, opening up the markets. Now, we see that as a particularly a big opportunity for the Central European region. Um, over the last 20 years, um, the Central European region has been going through a huge process of transformation and modernization. Now, so it happens that the internet, or even the World Wide Web, is also about 20 years old. Um, it was invented in, uh, in CERN, the European um, uh, Physics Laboratory, um, in 1983. So it's about 20 years old. Uh, economic modernization in Central European region is just over 20 years old. And the internet's changing really quickly, just as Central Europe has changed really quickly. For example, we're just seeing the move towards a mobile internet at the moment, which is just transforming the way that users use the internet and the way in which companies need to respond to that um, and to make their services uh, make their services available. Now that modernization process um, is an opportunity because there's so much change going on in the way that companies do business now. So from our perspective, there's a huge opportunity for countries to, to overtake those that are, uh, overtake the current champions, to catch up and to overtake. Um, if you look at, for example, the, uh, so because our services are, uh, one of the key observations that Google's able to make over the last few years is that the, the important measure that you want to be looking at in terms of uh, the economy is how many companies and how much economic activity is taking advantage of the internet. And we all know that the technology sector itself grows very quickly, but what matters is how, much, how that technology is being used by, uh, by the economy as a whole. So we've asked uh, people like BCG and also McKinsey to do estimates of how big is the internet economy um, around uh, different countries of the uh, different countries of the world. Now they did the calculations here in the Czech Republic, and it, came, it turned out that the internet economy was 3.6% of GDP. Now that's a pretty significant figure, and it's actually already higher than many countries in in southern Europe. Give you an idea of the sort of companies that are included um, in that. There's one. There's a, a local uh, a local company here in uh, here in the Czech Republic called Fleur.cz. Now, it's a platform. And what it basically does is if you're one of maybe the uh, members of the, the chairman of the former group, you make handicrafts and cultural, uh, cultural goods and so on, you can make your products available on this platform to anybody in the Czech Republic looking for handicrafts and, uh, and, and cultural artifacts. Now, that platform brings together buyers and sellers. Um, it's got nothing to do with the technology sector, although it obviously relies on the internet for people to be able to find, for buyers to be able to find sellers. But it's not. But it's basically the the ordinary economy finding new opportunities by using the internet. So if you were a if you were a maker of handicrafts in the eastern part of the Czech Republic, it may have been hard for you to find customers in Prague, for example. But now it becomes possible with the with the internet, and that. Exporting opportunity, so exporting from outside of the region where you're based to the rest of the country, to another country, to the United States, is exactly what becomes possible um, with the uh, with the internet. And so these are the uh, these are the opportunities um, that that we see from a sort of a 21st century uh, free trade agreement. But there are lots of things that need to be. But I think also. The observations of uh, some of the earlier speakers that this is a, that this is a chance to redefine the nature of trade agreements is also really important. Let me give you a couple of observations from an internet company on on these trade negotiations. A slightly different way of um, of looking at things, perhaps. Um, and of course, the template for trade agreements is you know it's maybe a couple of decades old, so it's no surprise that it. It may be slightly sort of creaking a little bit when we look at it from a from a modern uh, from a modern internet-based perspective. The first reason we heard a number of people this morning talk about the GDP benefits, so the, uh, the growth benefits 
of a trade agreement. I think they're indisputable. Uh, there will be a lot of uh, a lot of GDP benefits from uh, from the, the TTIP. But the internet has also created something a lot of something else as well, which is very valuable. It's called consumer service. And I won't bore you with the details, but I'll give you an example. If you think about Skype, Skype has meant um, an enormous lot of problems for the telecoms industry. The price of making a telephone call has been seriously undercut. In fact, Skype is free. So the price of telephone calls has been going down. Many people have been, using, uh, been making international telephone calls for free. Now that reduction in prices or that free service is basically bad news if you measure the economy in terms of GDP because nothing is being sold, it's now free. But of course consumers have benefited hugely, they can make as many phone calls to as many parts of the world as they want to um, as, a result of, uh, as a result of Skype. And there are lots and lots of instances that measure, we've measured for example, if you look at all of the different ways that people search on the internet. That's $54 billion of consumer service um, that, that around the world that has been accrued from people using uh, different types of search on the internet. So the internet creates something more than just GDP. And I'm wondering how the trade negotiators will take this into account. Because as we heard this morning, trade negotiations are all about uh, are sold to the public on the basis of GDP. And what I'm saying is that the internet brings much more than just GDP. The other is data. So trade negotiations are about goods and they're about services. But we live in a very different economy now, one that is driven by data. So if you listen to Commissioner Cruz, for example, in Brussels, she talks about data as being the new oil. Well, I only partially agree with her. Uh, data is extremely valuable. Um, it's at the root of uh, Google's economic um, success, for example. But unlike oil, data is not in long-term scarcity. Um, so I think oil is the wrong is the wrong way to think about it. It is not in long-term scarcity. I think maybe we could think about data as being the new solar energy, because there's absolutely masses of it. But we're we're learning now how to turn that source of uh, let's say we're learning how to turn solar energy into energy that we can use to power, our, to power our equipment. Or we're learning how to take data and turn it into things that help us make better business decisions and indeed better decisions um, in government as well. So we're living in an age of so-called data-driven innovation. And the companies that use data effectively are outperforming those that don't use data effectively. Now, the internet has few borders. So for me, the issue of customs duties and tariffs, you know, it doesn't immediately resonate. Anyway, you could add zero, but you could add 10% of the price of a Google search and it would still be zero, of course. So I, for me, the barriers that we need to be thinking about from a 21st century perspective are more regulatory than in terms of customs and, uh, and tariffs. And I think uh, some of the speakers uh, mentioned that before. So the first, obviously, is the area of data protection. We live in a world where data flows around the economy very easily. And these cross-border data flows are very, very significant in today's economy. And that's where what happened over the last couple of weeks with the, uh, the, the scare about prison is really important. And let me just confirm, I think, you know, many of you may have read it in the newspapers, uh, the NSA does not, have, uh, does not have access to the Google systems. They can come and ask us for data. And after our lawyers have inspected those requests, and if they've been found to be reasonable requests, then we will provide data to the US government. But they don't have automatic direct access um, over our data. Um, we would like to tell you how many of these requests are being made. Um, and we've gone to the courts in the United States to get the permission to say whether we, whether we do receive these requests, and, uh, and if so, to what extent um, we, uh, the, the number of those requests Cross-border data flows will not be possible unless we build some trust into the system. And I think for that we need more transparency in this whole area of law enforcement. So who would have thought that law enforcement cooperation might be a really important issue for trade negotiators? I, I think this is, the, this is the nature of the mindset change that we need to think about um, in, the, uh, in the 21st century. 
Another is copyright. Um, I think trade negotiation, you know, we've already seen the first instances of the, the cultural sector having an interest in this debate. But Hollywood has long had a huge uh, stake in uh, and, and a strong dialogue with the United States government about the types of strong copyright protection that they need around the world um, for, for the Hollywood business model. Absolutely agree with that. But what we don't hear very often around the world is the, is the other side of the copyright debate that is had in the United States. So the copyright, so copyright in the United States is strong enough for Hollywood, but it's also flexible enough for Silicon Valley. And a company like mine is built on this notion of fair use, which is a part of uh, the copyright regime in, uh, in, in the United States. And we'd like to see debate in the context of the TTIP, for example, on the balance of copyright. We had a debate a couple of years ago about enforcement provisions, and that, didn't, you know, that wasn't a very happy debate for the trade negotiators. But I think a balance in copyright rules um, that reflects you know, the need for flexibility as well as the need for strong rules, I think that's something that Europe and the United States uh, could very reasonably be expected to have. And the other issue is the liability of intermediaries. So if you're a company like Google, we provide people a, an opportunity, a way of finding their way around the 30 trillion, 30 trillion web pages that are out there on the internet. We have 100 hours of content uploaded onto YouTube every minute. 100 hours every minute. The scale at which we're working means that it is impossible for us to work on the, on the, in, the in the old media sense of the word, to have sort of editorial control over all this. So the way that we've, the way that we've constructed uh, legal regimes in the United States and in Europe is based on the idea that once we're top, that, that you have to come and tell Google when something is illegal, and then we uh, and then we take it down. And that's the right way to that's the right way to do it, but it's not the way that is being looked at in many parts of the rest of the world. And I think it's important that we set an example in this free trade agreement and make liability, intermediary liability protections for internet companies a central part of this. Not because there's anything really lacking on the EU or the US side but because this is the first agreement of the 21st century and we should be laying down a marker for the trade agreements that we might then subsequently want to, uh, to conduct with other countries around the world. So in conclusion, I definitely see the internet economy as a huge opportunity for Central Europe. And the TTIP just makes that even bigger. So the opportunities to export into the rest of the single market become opportunities to export into the rest of the transatlantic market. This is the first trade agreement of the 21st century, and we should really think of it in those terms. The issue will often not be about tariffs, but will be about regulation. We need to sort out and ensure that there's enough confidence in the area of privacy, and we need to have a really clear discussion about ensuring balance in the copyright space. And finally, we should agree together that we want to make intermediary liability protections fundamental to the future of all trade agreements that we do with the rest of the world, and there's no better place to start than within the one that we do together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, to, to, to keep your, your, your level, I think we have here representatives of, uh, um, let's say, goods logistics as UPS, data logistics as Google, Maybe uh, maybe service logistics, but you are bringing let's say good prices uh, from one one part of the world to the other. Uh, I, will, I will give the floor to, to Mr. Dalowitz from from Mr. Mozambi who present this his point of view. Good afternoon. There has been a lot of discussion about the internet economy. And um, so the question is, how large is it, and how, how much does it grow, and what can we do to, to stimulate it further? Can we put this discussion? Okay. Um, we have, uh, as BCG, together with, uh, with Google, we have studied the size and speed of growth of internet economies in, in G20 countries, so the, the 19 large world economies plus European Union. 
These countries represent about 88% of worldwide GDP, so it's a pretty, pretty representative uh, sample, and uh, we think the conclusions are pretty, uh, pretty representative. But before I go to the numbers and before I show you how, how large the internet economy is in our estimates and how fast does it grow, let me make one, one remark on the, on the topic of this conference. It's about cooperation, it's about trade agreements, it's about partnerships, it's about uh, investments. There is a, there's a well-established link between growth and cooperation. Cooperation is much easier in times of growth. When, when the cake is enlarging, the, the interested parties much easier to agree on how to cooperate. And therefore we can see, and there is empirical evidence in, in the economics papers, that periods of stagnation are characterized by, by protectionism, by exclusion, and periods of growth are characterized by openness and by inclusion. Now, of course, you might say that precisely to stimulate growth, we are trying to negotiate trade agreements. Um, I'm telling you that those trade agreements are easier to negotiate in times of growth, so it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem. And the way to solve it is to start from the part of the economy that's growing fast. And I'm going to submit to you that it is the internet economy that, that is even in today's world, which is characterized at least from the developed part of the world of relatively slow growth, slow by historical standards, that it is the internet economy that we should, we should begin with. So how, how, fast, how fast does it grow? And just to show some uh, maybe, uh, maybe obvious figures, the number of internet users in G20 economies over the period of 10 years, between 2005 and 2015, will have grown by about three times. The number of broadband connections will have grown by 16 times. And the amount of data or annual IP traffic will have grown 32 times. So these are pretty, pretty significant rates of growth. And um, it will be interesting to see how they translate into, into economic figures, into GDP. As uh, some of my predecessors commented, trade, trade uh, negotiators are, are fixated on, on GDP and on, on hard, hard economic figures. According to our estimates, uh, I think uh, uh, Simon said that, that we, we've estimated that uh, in the Czech Republic the share of internet economy on GDP is about 3.6%. Worldwide, in 2010, it was about 4%, and in 2016, it will, it will have grown to over 5%. So about 5% of world economy can be attributed to internet. What's more important is that this politically, so far, small slice of the world economy is growing very fast. It's growing about 20% a year in the developing part of the world, and about 10% a year in the developed part of the world. But even then, if 5% if of our economy grows at 10% annual rate, that's 0.5% of annual GDP growth. Compare that to, to current rates of growth, that's a, that's a pretty significant share of, of the growth. Worldwide, it's about 10%. In developed economies, it will be more. It'll be, it'll be over 20%. So, 10 to 20% of economic growth can be linked to, to the internet. Now, how do US and European Union stand in this comparison? Worldwide, we are at about, about uh, 4% now, over 5% in 2016. Um, there are some, um, some outliers, some stellar countries such as UK where this will be in 2016 over 10%. And only some other countries where large Asian countries, such as Indonesia, where this might be below 2%. When you look at the chart, you'll find US and, and uh, European Union, you will find that we are somewhere around, around average 5.7, 5.4%. So we're not laggards, but we're not the stellar, stellar front runners, such as South Korea or, or UK. Now, in terms of competitiveness, and one of the, one of the key words for this panel is competitiveness. One, one way to look at competitiveness and measure competitiveness is to look at the ability to export. Countries that are competitive can export a lot and become net exporters. Countries that are less competitive maybe need to print money and, and import and become net importers. Similar, similar calculations we can do on the on the internet slice of the economy. And when we did that, 
we see, and uh, we can this chart compares the 19 large world economies. Uh, uh, the size of the stack is the is the share, is the percentage share of, of internet econ on, on economy on, on GDP. And the blue part, if you see the blue part, the blue part is the uh, is the net ex export. It's above the line, and the uh, net import is below the line. UK is the only developed country that is net internet export. The other big net exporters are China, India, South Korea, and Mexico. UK because of the services, India, China mainly because of uh, of, uh, of exporting the hardware related related to internet. So this picture shows that there is a there is a space there is a space to increase competitiveness of the developed part of G20 where for European Union and the United States at the moment. Now, how can we do that? One of the questions asked before this panel was, what can we do to stimulate the growth, to stimulate the internet economy? And uh, I think there are probably two views of this. One, what I would call a skeptical view, is that, look, internet developed largely without government stimulus. It was uh, invented at universities. It was taken up by startups, not by government organizations. At least the massive, massive spread was not done by government organizations, so maybe governments should should let it uh, let it alone. But there are two reasons why governments and regulators take interest in internet. One is because some of the larger players draw draw interest uh, of regulators because of their power, and the second is because there is an increased recognition for social benefits and public benefits of of internet and internet internet infrastructure. Some economists estimate that. 10%, 10, to 10 percentage points in broadband penetration causes about 0.5% annual economic growth. This, has been, uh, this uh, research has been done on a, on a cross-section of, uh, of, of countries over, uh, over time, so it's, it's, it's pretty representative. So it seems there is a public benefit in having good internet infrastructure and high spread of internet. And if there is such a benefit, then maybe governments should play a role in spreading it. Similarly, as governments play a role in electrification and introducing, uh, introducing some of the previous generations of, of public infrastructure. And indeed, when we look at um, some of the successful examples of government, government, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't call them interventions, but government actions or government activities that that helped spread of internet and increased size of the of the internet economies, and uh, on, on, on the map, the dark countries are countries with highly developed internet, high share of, uh, of um, internet economy on the overall, overall economy, the lighter countries are less, less advanced countries. When you look at some of those dark countries, and look what governments have done that, they have done two things. They either directly invested into broadband infrastructure, or they, 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 they stimulated it. I think uh, a good example is uh, um, uh, Finland has legislated at least uh, a right to at least one megabit per second connection for every citizen. It's, it's, it's a right. It's a basic right. Um, government in, uh, in Sweden invested directly into spread of broadband infrastructure. So, so investments into, into broadband or into infra internet infrastructure. And the second Government activities that can be activity that can be linked to successful growth of internet and internet economy is uh, is providing public services or government services online. So digitizing digitizing public services. So and I'll leave you with those two thoughts: investment into broadband, into internet infrastructure, and digitization of, of government services are perhaps the two things that can be done. To, to stimulate growth and to make those trade life of those trade negotiations easier because they will be negotiating over over growing by. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Carlos. And now I will pass the floor to the Vice President of the Company, which uh, claims and handles the person of the world GDP to people is from UPS. Thanks very much, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I uh, am very pleased to be here, and I want to thank the association for this opportunity. Uh, this is my first time in the Czech Republic, my first time in Prague. Prague is indeed a very beautiful 
beautiful city, and uh, everyone has been very welcoming and accommodating. I've been told for my entire life that Prague is beautiful in the rain, and I'm now convinced that Prague is even more beautiful once the rain stops. But, uh, <laughs> It's been a, a wonderful few days, and I've met a lot of you at the various meetings that we've had. Um, a few facts about UPS. Uh, most people recognize our brand. We were founded in Seattle, Washington, as a bicycle messenger company in 1907. We have a, a long history uh, in delivering all kinds of different things. Um, our founders, after a short time of delivering messages via bicycle, decided that they would buy a couple of trucks because people who were shopping at department stores back before everybody had a car and before every store had a shopping a parking garage, people needed the parcels that they bought taken from the store to their homes. So we are, changed our name to Merchants Parcel Delivery. Uh, and after a short while, the people who ran our company at the time saw other markets in faraway places like California at the time, around 1910, 1911, 1912. We changed our name to United Parcel Service, uh, and we began serving different markets in California. And before long, we looked to uh, other department stores in other states, like Chicago and like New York City. What we soon found, though, is that if we wanted to ship things from New York across state lines to another state, we would have to obtain a separate license in each one of those states to operate our vehicles. In fact, it wasn't until the early 1980s that UPS gained the ability to serve the United States under one license. The last holdout was the state of Texas. So we have been combating barriers to trade in one form or another uh, since we started as a bicycle messenger company in 2007. Um, UPS expanded into Europe in 1976, and we currently employ 45,000 people. Uh, Europe is our single largest investment outside of the U.S. We believe very strongly in the European economy, uh, and we put our money where our mouth is. Um, we believe very, very much that the relationship between the United States and the European Union is worth betting on, and will do nothing but increase for companies both here and, and abroad. Um, we did some calculations recently. In 2011, uh, the total sales, the total number of sales between the U.S. and the EU was about $5.3 trillion. $300 billion of that in 2011 were trade services, which is of course what we provide. We have calculated through people who are much better at math than I am, that if a robust TTIP goes into place over the next decade, it will equal $131 billion in revenue for UPS, which will enable us to create 25,000 jobs, both here and, and in the US. Now, that sounds like a very good number, $131 billion for UPS. But what exactly does that mean? Remember, we are a service provider. We are only as good as our customers. If our customers grow, we grow. If our customers don't, we do not grow. So $131 billion in growth only means that our customers, including small and medium-sized enterprises, are growing and using and using our services. Um, a couple of re a couple of specific issues beyond sort of the trade is good uh, issues that are specific to UPS. I mentioned trade barriers earlier on when I talked about the licensing requirements that we had to fill out and fulfill uh, among states in the U.S. One of the key barriers to trade among countries is at the border. Uh, shipments, you can have a very efficient system, but if shipments are held up at border crossings for one reason or another, uh, it creates inefficiencies in the system and it, it, it acts as a barrier to trade. We made TTIP an issue that we feel is very important, is that we make sure that we harmonize border crossings both in the U.S. and the EU, and we are advocating on both sides of the Atlantic that, that companies who want to do business across borders have a very simplified technology-based access to, to fulfilling the customs requirements of each country. We also believe um, in many countries uh, we, we work with uh, state postal bureaus. Uh, in the United States, uh, the U.S. Postal Service is a partner of, United, of, of UPS on many, on many fronts, and in many other areas around Europe, we use our operational efficiency combined with the reach of state postal bureaus uh, to provide seamless service. 
At the same time, in many cases, we, we compete with those same, same entities. So an issue that we feel important is that organizations that provide a specific type of service to the same type of customer in a very similar manner should abide by the same set of rules and regulations. Um, again, UPS is only as good as our customers. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm happy to be here in the Czech Republic is that we employ over 350 people right here in, in the Czech Republic. 90% um, of UPS's business is export business in the Czech Republic. And what that means is that Czech-based businesses uh, are, are shipping goods and, and products outside of Czech to other markets. And we believe very strongly that TTIP will do nothing but increase the ability of businesses in, in the Czech Republic to, to increase their market share globally. Again, it's important to remember that UPS is only as good as our customers. And we, are, we serve 230 different countries worldwide, countries large and small. And we only prosper, we only make money if the businesses in each and every one of those countries is growing and prospering. And the key to that is cross-border trade. So again, UPS is very, very enthusiastically supportive of TTIP, and we will be working both in Brussels and in Washington to advocate for a robust TTIP uh, moving forward. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. And uh, our last speaker on this panel is uh, Mr. Matt Nistik, um, the economist and uh, professor of charge in Boris Yeltsin. Except for the fact that I'm Michael, uh, no. everything is fine because I will leave uh, Martin Nistik uh, on his own. Anyway, uh, okay, thank you. So let me just give you a couple of hints uh, which might be more environmental. Well, I've written down a couple of papers in the past on exactly the topic, but these you know, few hints might be, might be interesting, and at the end of the day, I will put uh, some suggestions. Uh, of course, uh, we know that uh, the main growth of Europe currently, for at least 2008-2011, which was discussion previously, is less than sub-Saharan Africa. You know, this is not a great achievement, and if you look at uh, recent IMF uh, outlook, so uh, if you look uh, in uh, current uh, colors, you know, red is very bad, you know, so it's not uh, to be seen in the uh, residual part of the world, while in the uh, Eurozone it's strongly present. You know. So these are the factors which are obviously not pretty nice. And if you look into the shape of the business cycle all around, so the Czech one, due to our uh, ratio of 80% uh, exports to, to GDP, is very much similar to EU 70, frankly speaking, because uh, uh, actually the full faith of our exports are going in just that direction. And uh, it's very much like different in the US, which I like. Uh, uh, for its uh, actually adequate response and adaptation, not in all aspects, but if you look currently in the situation with household debt to income ratio, it's back uh, below the euro area uh, ratio, and the same uh, adaptation was for real house prices and so on. So it must be also reflected then in its uh, digital part of the world, and of course, precondition of uh, the different. Uh, situation is growth of loans for households, while in the US it's growing, back again, uh, Europe actually is still having the big problems with interbank uh, uh, you know, loans, and uh, the only achievement which they was arrived was this on the stabilization. So, uh, coming back to the trade, if you look into the trade, so uh, the wealth trade uh, structure is significantly changing. You know? So if you look into share of the wealth trade between advanced to advanced countries, it's falling down. Uh, the share of uh, emerging to emerging countries is also growing still low. But uh, the choice then the advanced to emerging countries uh, trade is still growing. So so we see that this is uh, something 
uh, which must also uh, be responded by the service providers and any part in this. Specifically, still big trade with Africa, for example, is interesting because Africa is really matching in these days using digital techniques even for banking, you know, and for uh, quite a new services. And we can see that uh, this is not uh, anything like uh, Europe, which is uh, actually significant in that part of the world, while uh, China is preeminently important. Another environmental factor for our uh, issue is also the shell gas in the US, which totally changed the whole picture of uh, the worst trade with gas because uh, what is blue here uh, has disappeared uh, coming from Qatar to the US because uh, actually sustainable growth in uh, shell gas and uh, shell gas was actually in the factor of one to nine cheaper than in Europe, now it's four to five multiple. And this is something which creates significant problems also for centers of excellence because, as far as we know, also uh, you know, huge consumption and sensitivity towards the price of power is something which actually has been responded by a number of players in Europe. And uh, I must say that this is a good message for the US, which is solving its actual uh, emission issues as well, and so on and so on. So these are those environmental points. Uh, and the other interesting point is a big discussion about the trade with uh, the products which are being produced uh, for uh, this digital revolution. Uh, those uh, you know, global value chains, which are which are also being supplied by the logistic companies, are uh, adding uh, this very valid trade in a very different picture than what is usually being seen. I, uh, I just want to say that uh, uh, without the digital technology, those complicated uh, you know, networks of global value chains would, uh, would hardly exist at all. On the other side, uh, uh, here is a case of Apple iPhone. Uh, been produced in so many countries and being assembled in the, uh, the final book in China, which adds only 65 actually out of uh, uh, 6.5 dollars out of 187 dollars. It was a case of being calculated. And everything else has been produced worldwide. So this is also shaping uh, worldwide trade. And uh, unfortunately, for the Czech Republic, uh, take the hardware issue, uh, so value chains in electronics are pretty much like significant here. And uh, we are actually one of the countries, this, uh, because we are a small country, we do not have many resources, and we have strong electronics imports and exports. So uh, calculation goes that uh, for electronics, up to 58% uh, of uh, uh, are intermediate import, uh, imports, imported and exports. So, uh, so these are the figures, and, and now we are coming to the real point. Yeah. So these are environmental points, uh, environment which we are living in. And uh, uh, here, uh, just please take into account that uh, I'm also the chairman of the International Chamber of Commerce, and we have uh, prepared for the 20 meetings uh, IC Open Market Index. Uh, 2013, and what was said that uh, actually every score uh, was actually uh, changing, and unfortunately, uh, although the G20 leaders consistently emphasize the importance of open markets, the average of G20 countries scores in, uh, in our index is in fact slightly below the average of the 75 country sample. So, uh, frankly speaking, uh, this is a situation which is uh, actually not pretty nice. Here there are some more uh, points. And uh, uh, of course, uh, if you go back uh, to the digital economy itself, so we believe that uh, you know, the whole day which is being supplied by this uh, digital uh, revolution, you know, also should be digitalized. 
So uh, we have an ICC Commission on Digital Economy, which is evaluating uh, our position. And uh, this is coming with a number of uh, strong points how to improve the situation. We have uh, certification, uh, certificates of origin which are being supplied. But if you ask me which countries do uh, actually accept uh, those certificates, this is Australia, this is uh, Asia, a uh, number of those groups, but not Europe, and only in a limited uh, extent, uh, this is the US. Uh, this is a purely uh, you know, government, government issue to negotiate, uh, actually, that those documents must be actually accepted. And uh, as a next step, uh, this is also the question of who should do those, uh, you know, who should take those responsibilities because there is also a liability issue, you know, uh, if you are issuing those certificates of origin. So uh, this is an uh, issue which is also government to government rather than company to company. And uh, then we are having a digital trade uh, when all documents uh, actually uh, should be digital formed. We have very big programs with fake uh, documents verified. Uh, in a number of cases, people are complaining that uh, computers are so wonderful that uh, if you use a uh, number of uh, documents being used in, uh, for the trade, and so these are subject to uh, falsification. And uh, then the question is uh, whether, of course, to solve it uh, by the arbitration issue, of course, ICC is the important arbitration court, but on the other side, uh, should we uh, go rather in the digital way? I would go in that way, you know, and uh, I would be happy to, to, to listen to suggestions from my colleagues here. Because currently, imagine we are living in digital world, we have heard that uh, in a you know, presentations, but uh, imagine that all documents, uh, uh, let's say, for, for fading, for guarantees, bank guarantees, bank documents are being copied, uh, uh, not facts, but, uh, you know, sent by as a copies and so on, which is uh, analogy to digital and digital to analogy. So, uh, from my perspective, uh, there is a significantly underutilized uh, point. On the other side, uh, probably these are only minor problems uh, if you compare it with current problems of environmental uh, type. And that is why I understand that uh, this is not a high priority list of the governments currently. And if you compare it with the problems of raising the taxes, raising the custom duties, like recently in a few fields and so on, I'm, I'm going always for support of free trade. And as we saw, those three values are um, not decreasing, but increasing. So, this is my question mark. You know, I understand the optimism over the digitalization. I would uh, go for it. Uh, I support it in the Czech Republic for one stop shop, uh, uh, you know, using the info uh, from different locations uh, as a part of our international competitive strategy. But uh, I'm trying to put it into my perspective, and I will be more than happy to listen to the opinion of my colleagues in the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Michal Mistri. Um, before I will uh, give the floor to, to questions or comments uh, from public, I will ask panelists if you want to react on one each other, if there is something which strikes you and uh, you want to comment. Yeah. Um, so, I could say exactly the same as Nick did in the sense of Google is only as good as its customers are. If you think about it, an e-commerce purchase, in fact, no, even a, even a normal purchase, um, it starts with finding a customer and it finishes with delivering to the customer what they, what they bought. So 
we see the world very similarly. We do a different, we do a different part of the support to companies that want to grow and take advantage of um, the uh, the opportunities from the European single market, or indeed the future opportunities from a from a, from a transatlantic market. Um, the but I would like to come back on the point that uh, the colleague from BCG made. Um, it does seem to be the case that a 10% increase in broadband leads to a half percent increase in GDP. That's been well documented. But I think we need to understand why that is. It's not because the telecoms industry building a bigger broadband network creates half a percent more GDP. It's because broadband availability creates opportunities for entrepreneurs to build new businesses that take advantage of it and to grow those businesses from a region to a country to a continent and even um, across, across the Atlantic. So the issue, the reason why broadband matters is because people learn how to use it. And I think it was interesting, there were some statistics published by the European Commission a couple of weeks ago that said almost all of the European Union has got broadband at the first level, but only 50% of people have got the digital skills to be able to use that broadband. So everybody has access to the internet, but only half the people actually know how to use it. So I don't conclude from that that the next thing we need to do is to build more broadband. We need that in due course, but I think the first thing we need to do is to make sure that the other 50% of people know how to use what, what is currently already, uh, already available to them. And those people you know, will not only use it at home, which will create the opportunities to purchase online and, and for the entrepreneurs, but they will also find their way into the workforce and help, you know, help become the, uh, the entrepreneurs of, of tomorrow, taking advantage of the internet to build, to build, uh, to build um, services and, 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 and to deliver to people. Thank you. Are there other comments on the panel? If not, are there any comments or, or questions in, in the public? I guess there is a microphone somewhere. Any, I will start with, with asking one question to all panelists. Uh, as we heard this morning, the, um, the horizon of negotiations and then entering into force of the IP is, may, is long, uh, could be long, it could take years. There are some ambitious plans that it, uh, it should, was supposed to be finished, and the talks are supposed to be finished next year. But uh, what what, what can uh, let's say, what, what can uh, our countries, the European countries, and the United States do b before the the TTIP will be in force? Uh, especially in our uh, in the domain of this this panel, what what are the cycles of of, of e-commerce or digital economy today? Uh, and uh, is is it really true that the TTIP will will solve these problems, or can we do something uh, prior to? This to the moment when it will entry, hopefully, uh, to force. Someone comment on this? <laughs> um, I'm happy to take that. Um, as, as Elena said earlier, uh, the good news is, is that we know what the issues are, and the bad news is that we know what the issues are. Um, as, as in any negotiation, um, there are going to be areas of, of, of agreement and, and areas of, uh, of disagreement. Um, however, it's clear to most parties that a, a, a broad trade agreement between the U.S. and the EU is critical, both in the context of our individual economies, but more particularly in the context of, of the global economy. Um, the best thing that I think people with access to this uh, panel can, can do is ensure that there is a level of education not only among the, with the in Brussels and, and Washington, but an education that takes place uh, among small and medium-sized companies, multinational companies, state and local governments, uh, you know, country governments, to educate people as to how specifically and and and, and uh, an agreement like this is beneficial across the board, um, both in terms of being beneficial. Uh, and in some ways, perhaps more importantly, the potential harm in not getting agreement. Uh, we, we live in a global world. 
and we are still the two strongest economic engines worldwide. Um, I guess probably the simplest way to put it in my mind is when people ask why, the, the responding question should be why not. Let's not focus on, on, on the barriers, but uh, focus on all of the reasons why we should do this. Thank you. Mr. Mason, you want to comment for Mr. Collins? Maybe two quick comments. Internet is growing very fast in terms of number of users, number of uh, connections, number of uh, amount of data. Perhaps faster than previous technologies that were being, uh, being introduced that could go back down to electricity or steam engines and so on. And yet we're asking the question, you know, why is, why is it not going faster? So I think partly it's a perception. It's we, we got used to things spreading very fast and we like them even faster. Um, but it's still a fair question. It's still a fair question here. I would agree with, uh, with, with Simon. It is about um, sort of absorption capacity of society to learn, to, to learn things. Yeah? The internet is, is competing against, in many countries, well-established brick and mortar world. Yeah? Um, where we have, where we, for example, when we look at the, the share of the internet on, on, uh, on GDP, you find out the Czech Republic is higher share than, than Italy. Why is that? Simply, it's, it's in consumption, it's, um, it's, it's, it's online purchases, that, that's what, what, what drives it. But why are online purchases relatively high in the Czech Republic? Because of availability. Go shopping in Milano and go shopping in Prague. Okay? Um, the relative benefit of having an access to the online world is bigger in Prague than it's in, in Italy, not speaking about the weather and, uh, and so on. So there, there is a there is a there's a time needed until until society at large learns um, and absorbs the new technology and whether it's happening at fast enough pace or not um, I'm not sure yeah, it is happening relatively fast. Uh, let me add uh, one other point uh, which was not mentioned here. Uh, actually, me and my colleagues are also using open source data. You know, basically. Infrastructure, so it can uh, generate plenty of info, uh, making the life transparent, making the uh, public uh, procurement transparent. On the other side, uh, uh, frankly speaking, these open source data are hiding a uh, number of, I would say, interesting uh, features uh, which can be also important for commercial uh, life, but also dangerous for personal life. Yeah. And uh, of course, uh, the more you know, uh, the, I would say, digital divide between those who can use uh, actually the internet uh, uh, in a qualified way and uh, those who can use the internet in a less qualified way uh, under a situation when they are not perfectly well aware what kind of data they are providing to the system uh, and uh, what can be the feedback for them. So it has actually pros and cons. And uh, I, I must say that I am one of those who can make use of uh, open data, open source data, and so on. But uh, uh, my uh, big question is that uh, seeing this uh, big uh, digital divide between those who are uh, either not qualified at all or less qualified, so it creates a uh, big trouble and uh, it, might, it might backfire in the future. So uh, this is a big, uh, you know, uh, open field for the education for the future, for sure, because otherwise uh, until you can fail at least some part of it. Get, you know, it can create a big and a shocked public in the future. Well, I obviously agree with both the, the previous two speakers. I mean, the, the absorption capacity uh, of society is itself more or less directly linked to the skills capacity of society. And that's linked to the ability to take advantage of the internet. And that's effectively linked to the optimism with which a country will approach 
the opportunities of, say, a TTIP, which means that the opportunities to, to take advantage of the internet go beyond just Europe and become a, a transatlantic opportunity. So, at the heart of all of this is to make sure that we have people that know how to use uh, the internet and, and that are you know, well educated to take advantage of it. And that doesn't mean creating the next generation of Google engineers. That means just simply those people that can work inside a firm and help modernize the firm, help it operate in a, in a more modern way um, and to take advantage of the uh, to take advantage of the opportunities. I mean the youth unemployment in this in this scenario is the you know is, is an even worse, I mean it's a social injustice, but actually becomes a massive economic problem because you know, if you think about it, all the, you know, there's a generation of people that have grown up with the internet day in, day out. They know how the internet works, they know how to take advantage of it. But too many of those people are excluded from the workforce now. So companies that desperately need the modernization efforts of young people can't have don't have the young people inside their inside the workplace to take advantage of it. So you know there's a huge amount of, uh, of change that, that's needed. Inside, inside the workplace. And I mean, when I look at the transformation that has gone on in the Central European region over the last 20 years, I think that's the, you know, we may need to go through another wave of that transformation, but I'd like to think that this region is optimistic about the benefits of making transformation. And I think that, you know, that's the big opportunity sort of relative to other parts of Europe is, is that, you know, you can embrace transformation and, you can, and if you're willing to embrace it again, then I think you'll see huge benefits from being becoming a leader in terms of the internet market. Thank you. That was the first question. The gentleman in the fourth row. I'd like to present yourself. No, no, no. First, the gentleman over there, and then. Uh, um. Hi, I'm uh, Tom Wakey from the Council on Foreign Relations. My question is for Simon. Uh, first of all, thanks everyone for uh, your presentations. But, um, I was intrigued by Simon's presentation on copyright and data protection. Uh, and it's definitely an area where you've seen technology uh, changes right in business models, and the laws and regulations are still evolving in response to these technological changes in new business models. Uh, this presents a tension for trade negotiators, where you're looking for how to establish the flexibility for that evolution to occur in those business models and the new regulatory models to emerge in response, with the need also to provide businesses with predictability, particularly for businesses like yours, which are inherently cross traditional how, how do you, what are you looking for in these trade negotiations in terms of balancing, um, uh, balancing the need for predictability and flexibility in these areas? And is the answer the same for copyright and privacy? So I think you're absolutely right about um, consistency. Um, it would be a benefit to us. Um, clearly, the EU and the US separately are big enough for us to be, you know, to be markets that we can adjust to um, on, on a continent-wide basis. Um, it gets even harder once you start sort of segmenting countries um, you know, one by one by one, and that's uh, that's something that I think you know, the reason why we support a lot of the single market uh, the single market process. But what I really I mean, the, the the opportunity with these negotiations um, is that they create some urgency to sit down and talk together. Now, I, mean, I don't know whether we'll be completing this uh, by the end of next year, but I think there's a little bit of urgency, and I think we're also seeing this being framed in terms of how can we create growth and jobs. Um, so a discussion about copyright and about privacy that is framed in terms of jobs and growth. Is already a hundred times, uh, you know, more healthy than, uh, than than some of the frameworks that we that, that we currently have. So I think the urgency in the framework will make a difference. Um, on the other hand, and we saw this last year with ACTA, you no, know, these are very complicated issues with enormous number of stakeholder interests, and trade negotiations happen largely in secret. So you know, there is. I mean, that's the trade-off that I see. Right, the urgency. Versus the secrecy, um, and I think that, that that's I, I don't know how to solve that, but I think that's the trade-off. Thank you, the gentleman over there.
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Surabhaj Bhujak and I am a student of International Affairs at the University of Economics in Prague. I would like to ask Mr. Hampton and Mr. Lewis about, uh, well, we were talking mainly about the uh, positive effects of TTIP, but do you see any fears of this agreement from the side of your companies and how do you prepare generally for new free trade agreements um, in your companies? Thank you. Uh, I'm happy to take that. Thanks for the question. Um, when I started my remarks, um, I mentioned the challenges that, that UPS had as a growing business in the United States, uh, trying to deal with um, our desire to grow and our desire to serve the entire continental United States before we ever considered expanding into Europe. Um, we have consistently viewed uh, broader trade and the broader flow of commerce in a positive light. Um, we again, we are a service provider, so we are only as good as our customers are globally. Uh, we could, I, I, I don't know that our founder, Jim Casey, could have envisioned in 1907 when he bought his first couple of bicycles that we would be this company with over 300 jet aircraft uh, and 100,000 ground vehicles serving, you know, countries far and wide. Um, for us, and in particular for our customers, cross-border flow of commerce is a, is a good thing, uh, obviously in terms of commerce, but there is a reason why uh, we have generally a world of, of peace and understanding, and that is because of the flow of commerce. So as far as uh, the benefit globally to, to mankind uh, and in general, um, certainly at UPS, uh, we believe that uh, open borders and the free flow of commerce is nothing but uh, nothing but positive. So I did a quick check on my favorite search engine, and <laughs> it turns out that the Uruguay round, so the last World Trade Organization agreements that were concluded, were concluded before Google had even been set up. So they concluded in 94, Google was established in 1997. So we are younger than any global trade agreement that has ever been uh, ever been adopted. Um, so we are very new to this space and we don't have any great experience. But what I can say is we have, we've been following some of the free trade agreements that have been contemplated, especially you know, over the last few, few years. Um, and we've done it. One of the things that we've been looking at in that context has been um, the role of the internet in furthering sort of democratic reform and the, and the, and the creating stronger democratic foundations in countries. And so we've been looking very carefully at whether it's possible to put an intermediary liability protection regime into trade agreements because not only is that good for companies like us that operate at huge scale um, as a business, but also it creates the foundations for free expression. Right? So if you think about, we hope that, you know, that there's, a, there's a hope that, that trade and, uh, and, and economic influences will start to dismantle some of the some of the non some of the, the non-democratic regimes around the world. That will only happen if we have uh, platforms that are open to trade, but also open to free expression. And so for us, one of the things that we want to see in trade groups that would make us more optimistic is if they include an emphasis on these intermediary liability protections, because I think that would make a huge difference, um, not only for the economy, but also for democracy. Thank you. Uh, other questions? There's still the judicial divide between the, the audience and maybe the, the panel. Uh, I, I will ask one question because there was a. So we had this morning here uh, one of the panelists or the moderator on the previous panel was Mr. Havice, who is the, the representative of Czech SMEs. Um, um, I will uh, uh, ask the question this way. Is the, uh, the, for, for many SMEs which are dealing especially with their small part of business, and we saw in the graphic that the trade is, the Czech trade with the United States is very like 2% of, 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 uh, of all Czech uh, foreign trade. Uh, 
what, what will the, the, the GTA be uh, bring to, to, to SMEs? Is it something which is very far away uh, from there, or the, the, the most who uh, will benefit from the from 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 the GTA will be the, the biggest companies which are able to operate globally, or um, do you see a contribution of, of, of the GTA for, for for local companies with less than I don't know even less than 250, but less than let's say 100 companies which are the majority of, of them here in the region? Sure, I'm happy to start that off. Um, you know. One of the main benefits that, that, that an agreement like TTIP, and specifically uh, what TTIP can do, is basically uh, provide ease of use in terms of uh, cross-border commerce. Um, UPS is, is a multinational company. I mean, I'll probably get into trouble for saying this, but our legal department is bigger than most SMEs out there. Um, if you are a small and medium-sized enterprise, uh, and you have a finite uh, market, your home country, or even in some cases in the U.S., your home state, um, there are many tools out there that now exist to allow you to expand your market. Not the least of those tools, of course, is the internet. You can deal with customers that you've never met, that you've never seen face to face, and in some ways that's thrilling, and in some ways that's daunting. Imagine doing business online with someone who you've never met, and you're expecting them to pay you somehow. And then imagine that you have to accept payment in a currency that you've never dealt with before. Um, through greater harmonization of, of standards and greater access to these markets over time, the ease of use for small and medium-sized enterprises through cross-border trade and broader markets will do nothing but improve. Let me say one point. Uh, for example, in the Czech Republic, we are having something like 17,000 plus uh, exporting companies. Out of those, 10,000 are exporting. Uh, actually, let's say, send them part of their exports to EU. And the other, uh, this is interesting, it's not less but more than to EU. Uh, 12,000 companies are exporting to non-EU. And so from this number, you can see that by far there are not uh, only the huge companies uh, which are involved in this. And you can see that those who are actually pushed uh, for such an uh, export expansion, uh, because there is a lack of domestic demand. So most of those are really working hard on their, on their web pages. You know. I must say that uh, this is a significant development the day by day. The situation is not uh, by far perfect, but uh, if you compare, for example, the way how the companies are presenting their goods and services, uh, formerly these were uh, actually uh, the fairs, you know, the popularity of uh, physical fairs is very limited, uh, much less than in the past and only for specific goods and services. On the other side, you know, most of uh, presentations, comparisons, you can see only on the web page. And this is the way uh, which is much more actually efficient for most of the companies because they can update it uh, very quickly. People can download the content if they like. And uh, the only question is how to uh, attract uh, the customers. So, so you can see the significant move in the direction of using it for commercial purposes. Any other comment on the service? So, some people ask, who is Google's competitor? Or does Google have any competitors? And the answer is yes. And, and this is a perfect way of thinking about who those competitors are. If you're a small business, as Nick has just explained, it's never been easier to be a global player. And we would argue that using Google advertising is a great way to go and find customers. But, and this is the important bit, you could also be a seller on eBay, or you could also be a seller on Amazon and many of the other types of platforms like that. So 
the, the way to think about the way to think about the world from an SME perspective is how do I find customers around the rest of the world? Google's an opportunity, but so is Apple, so is eBay, and so are lots of other people. And that's the reason, you know, and then you've got the logistics bit that's been sorted out. Hopefully the financial services industry will be disrupted soon um, so that it can become far more uh, far more fluid for, for SMEs. Probably needs you know, a lot of uh, a lot of disruption um, by new players into that market. Um, but I think uh, the, you know, the opportunity has never been bigger, and it's precisely because Google faces competition from people like eBay and Amazon um, in providing that platform for small businesses to grow. Just to mention a couple of examples, Czech Republic and Slovakia are home to three of the top worldwide five security companies, internet security companies. As I said, ABG, Avast are all, some of them probably still qualify as SMEs. I think Avast is less than 250, uh, 250 employees. And they are they are worldwide, worldwide players. Partly it's because of the openness of the internet, partly it's because of digitization, and they don't need to ship anything physically. Um, and these examples, the, the, other, the other in the top five are McAfee, that you probably know as Kaspersky, maybe, maybe Microsoft is uh, among the top uh, uh, five or six. So um, I think this, this is a, a motivating example, maybe, maybe an extreme, but, but an example of, of um, how uh, SME, TT or not TT, but because of technological progress and innovation, can sort of conquer the world. Do we have a few more minutes for other questions, comments, maybe in Czech, we have translation, maybe in English? Yeah. Karatansky, Italian economist, as far as I know, there are just a number of Internet users are Chinese-speaking teenagers and small-sized Chinese firms. Does it imply or is any need for automatized translation Chinese, English, English, Chinese on a computer system? Or should we allow existence of large size, let's say, island of Chinese users on the computer system? I'm not sure if I understand well. You think you are questioning if there is a need for for such kind of services of translation? The question is, is the natural language used by computer users is a barrier for cross-border trade or not? Thank you. Well, it's clear that people feel more comfortable shopping in their own language. So any entrepreneur looking to go into another language um, would be wise to get their site translated. But if you wish, you don't you can go and have a professional translation and if you're really actively targeting another country. So for example you're going from the Czech Republic into Germany, you might want to get your website translated into German. But as long as you're comfortable in selling to anybody in the rest of Europe or on a transatlantic basis, um, and the customers are confident in your site, then of course there are things like Google Translate that will do an on-the-spot translation of your website as you're using it. So any site can be read in any other language, or at least any of 65 languages that uh, the Google Translate uh, deals with. Now, you know, the trust issue will go down because the translation is not perfect and so on, but and trust is really important for a purchase to take place. Um, but I would say you know, there are two different levels. Actively translate if you want to target another market, um, but if you want to welcome orders from other countries, then you know, the technology is built into at least most modern browsers to translate it on the spot. But the question was if I understand the translation between Chinese and let's say English. I don't know whether Google provides such a translation. Yes, we do. Um, it's. Uh, in every, I mean, Google Translate is really interesting. It's, a, it's very much a big data service. If you think that the way that the translation used to work, uh, computer translation used to work, it was done the same way as, as an adult learning to speak a foreign language 
So you taught a computer all the rules of grammar, and here are the words, and you know, here's the translation of the words. And so it was, so translation technology used to be based on the way adults do it. And then about 10 years ago, they flipped, and they moved over to a system where uh, translation by computers is done in the way that children learn languages, which is simply that you just, ex you just expose the computer to an enormous amount of um, of translated texts. So here's the you know here's the Czech text, and here's the corresponding English text, for example. And the European Union creates huge quantities of these translated texts, for example. And the computer just looks at this in the same way as the child does, and it hears and it hears and it hears, and it eventually finds the pattern in the language and begins to learn to speak it. So in any in, in between any countries where there's a lot of trans pre-existing professionally translated texts. And I think between Chinese and, and, and American English, there's going to be many, many, many of those. Um, then you've got the basis for uh, machine translation. So computers learn like children rather than like adults. I, uh, as an interesting fact about UPS, and I have to be very careful when I say this, because I'm sitting next to a gentleman that looks for a company with a fairly popular website. But <laughs> before, before Google and before Facebook exploded, um, UPS.com, in certain times of the year was the most heavily trafficked website on the web. Um, our website, our homepage, UPS.com, gives every user who logs onto that global website the opportunity to pick their language. And I would say that if you're a company that hopes to do business globally and you do not offer a, a selection of languages for your customers to access, then you're, you're, you're shooting yourself in the foot. The whole reason why we're here um, is because of the, the need for global trade uh, to, to, and, and the need to manage global trade effectively. Uh, and it really is uh, imperative that you don't create barriers based on language to access your products and services. Uh, if you do, you're, 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 missing, you're missing a basic joke. Okay, we are going to finish. There are no other comments. Uh, I would like to invite you for uh, for lunch here, and we will meet here in 30 minutes, as far as I know, um, for the last uh, last panel, uh, think tank panel. Thank you very much.